join together with us in praising and worship the Lord. Um, listen to the word of God. But the Bible said that this is a day that the Lord has made. It doesn't matter what's happening all around us. The Bible called us and God encouraged us to come and to rejoice and to find our strength, to find our hope in Him. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to find our hope in the Lord. For God is our refuge, is our fortress, is a very present help in time of need. And God is always there for us, Lord. So once again, I want to thank you. Thank you for joining together with us in this streaming um, live. And once again, let's look up to the Lord, the word of prayer before we start worshiping the Lord. Why don't we look up to you this morning, Lord? We want to thank you for the strength and the help that you've given unto us, Lord. To be able, Lord, to wake up, Lord, and <coughs> gather together in this living room, Lord, for the purpose of glorifying worship you, Lord. God, we know that there is no limit to what you can do, Lord. Nothing can stop you, Lord. So we ask you that you put out your spirit, Lord, that you use this broadcast, Lord, this streaming light, Lord, to accomplish your purpose in this day, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for all we, for we believe, Lord, that you're going to do great and mighty things in the hearts of people, Lord. So, Father, once again, I thank you. And I give the glory and the honor in the name, which is higher than any other name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.
share with you this morning for a few minutes on something that the Lord has really impressed in my heart in this past week. Been another week where, you know, we've been um, separated from one another, you know, social distancing, got to make sure that we come in contact, we'll make sure we don't assemble together. And as this week passed by, what the Lord put in my heart is the importance of unity. And that's what I want to speak to you this morning for a few minutes, the blessing of unity. We live in a society and we live in a country which is very divided. We are so divided, we can get along with one another. I think in the past three and a half, four years, we've become more divided than ever before. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that in the past three and a half years, four years, we've become more divided than any time before. We cannot even have a civil conversation. We cannot sit down around a table and try to have a, a conversation that we attack one another, we belittle one another, we call one another name. Everybody speaks about tolerance. We all need to be tolerant with one another. But to many people the idea of tolerance is a one-way street. You must agree with me. You must believe and you must accept whatever I say because if you don't do, and then you become intolerant. And they call your kind of name, but see, intolerant, uh, it's a two-way street. I accept your belief, I accept your idea, I accept everything that you want to say, but in response, you also must accept mine, and you must accept what I believe. And only in this contest we can have uh, a productive and a healthy conversation. In the book of Matthew chapter 12, begin on verse 22, <coughs> we read this word. Then they brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and he was mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Take the picture. They brought a, per a man who was demon-possessed to Jesus. He was blind, he was mute. And Jesus, his mercy, Jesus, in his compassion, healed the man. And he was able to see. And he was able to speak. What a great miracle. And all the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Belzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drive out demon. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drive out Satan, is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Jesus healed the man. He was able to see. He was able to hear. But the Pharisee was not happy. See, the Pharisee was the, ro the only roller of Jesus' day. There was the legalistic religious leader of Jesus' day. They could not stand him performing miracle and demonstrate that the kingdom of God has come, that the grace and mercy of God was present in their midst. So instead to rejoice in the miracle that Jesus performed, they complained. And they accused Jesus in their mind that he was casting out demons by the power of Belzebub, the prince of the demon. You know, it's interesting. They did not verbalize loudly their thoughts, but said that Jesus knew their thoughts. And Jesus knows everything that goes through my mind, 
Jesus knows everything that goes through your mind. He can read our mind clearly. So what sometimes we think that because we don't say things or we don't speak words, God does not know what we're thinking, but God knows. Nothing is hidden from Him and nothing catches by surprise. So Jesus know, knew their thoughts. He knew they were thinking. And then He tried to make them understand how ridiculous the argument was. How ridiculous to accuse him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus make a tremendous statement that every kingdom that is divided against itself, it will be ruined. Every city, every household that is divided against itself, it will now and there's a lot of families they are divided against each other husband can stand their wife wife can stand their parent their husband children cannot stand the parents we cannot stand anyone but Jesus said a house divided against itself it will not stand it will, it will be ruined. It will be destroyed. Jesus is saying their disunity leads to destruction. Let me say again. Disunity leads to destruction. Disunity causes weakness. Disunity leads to simple behavior that is power in unity. Let me say again, that is power in unity. And Jesus emphasized this, pre this principle also in, in John chapter 17 when he prayed to the Father. And he said, Father, I want that this whom you are given unto me be one like me and you. And the Holy Spirit as one. Jesus emphasized and he prayed and asked the Father to give unity to his disciple. And God is emphasized this morning to us how important it is for us to become one. In Leviticus chapter 26 verse 8 speaks about the importance of unity. We read this word. Five of you will chase 100. Five of you will chase 100. But a hundred of you will chase 10,000. And your enemy will fall by the fourth before you. Five of you. A hundred. A hundred of you. 10,000. It's the power of unity. When we are united, we can accomplish more. When we are united we can fight together and we can defeat whatever enemy comes against us. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 two are better than one. Two are better than one. You know my wife passed away almost five weeks ago. And in this, in this five weeks since she passed away, she went, to, she went to be with the Lord. I learned how blessed I was when I have someone to share with me the ups and downs of life. Someone who was there with me to confront, to fight, and to win every battle that comes against us. This blessing in unity. Two are better than one because they have a good return for they labor, labor. I don't know if you have learned this, but we, face, we are confronting and we're facing a virus. Pand pandemic virus all over the world. The virus does not discriminate. 
He doesn't care if you are a Republican. He doesn't care if you are a Democrat. He doesn't care if you are independent. He doesn't care if you are a Libertinian. He doesn't care what party association you have. He doesn't care about the color of your skin. He doesn't care about the, your social status. He doesn't care how much money or little money you have. The virus will attack anyone. And it will turn people life upside down, causing pain and many times causing death. On the, on the other side, on the opposite side, even though a lot of time we're trying to make God fit into our preconceived idea, on the opposite side, God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. God is not independent. God is not a Libertinian or whatever party. It could be on the face of the earth. The Bible makes very clear that God is holy. God is holy. The writer of Hebrew, in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 14, he writes this word, make Make every effort to live in peace. Again, make every effort to live in peace. To be united. To get along with people. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. And to be holy. We not only encourage and command it to live in peace with other people, but also to be holy. And then he said that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Very restricted. Without holiness. Without a passion and desire to do the right thing. Without a passion and desire to please God and to obey Him and to follow His commandments. We will not see Him. The message put it this way. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise you will never get so much as a glimpse of God. It's time to put aside our differences as a country, as a nation. And it's time to come together. Proverbs 14, 24 says this, Righteousness exalts the nation. But sin condemn any people. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin condemn any people. Let me read a, a few different translations. This translation put it this way: Doing what is right makes a nation great. Did you hear that? Doing what is right. Not in, own, in our own eyes, but in the eyes of God, makes a nation great. But sin will bring disgrace to any people. Sin will bring disgrace to any people. Let me read one more translation. Doing what is right lift people up. When we do what is right, we are going to be lifted up. But sin... Bring judgment to any nation. Sin bring judgment to any nation. Maybe God has had enough of our disunity. Maybe God has had enough of putting one another down, of can't stand each other. And that's the reason that he had caused this virus to come and to attack us. Maybe God is trying to teach us that we must come together as a nation. We must come together as a people. We must be united. But you know something? True unity in a personal life True unity.
unity in a marriage, true unity in a family, true unity in churches all around the world, true unity upon a nation, true unity in this world. It is a very important thing. And this is found in Psalm 130, 127 verse 1. In Psalm 127 verse 1 we read this word, Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain who build it. <coughs> you want a strong marriage? You want a strong family? You want a strong nation? You want a strong church? A blessed? God must be part of, of it. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Those who build it. You're wasting your time, the Bible said. If God is not part of your plan, if God is not part of your task, you're wasting your time. You are not going to build something that will endure the test of time. Unless the Lord guard the city. Notice, unless the Lord guard the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. God has got to watch over us. God has got to watch over us as a country. Otherwise, the watchmen will guard in vain. We need to bring God we need to bring God back in the picture. We have fired him. We have dismissed him. We think we can do a better job. We think that we know better. And look at the consequence that we are facing on a daily basis. We need to get back we need to get God back in the picture. See, the founding father understood this principle. That's why when they got together, they wrote the Constitution, many of their speech demonstrate humbleness and the need for God. In God we trust. In God we trust. Do we really trust in the Lord? But we want the blessing of God to be upon us. God must come back in the picture. God must be in charge. See, there is a, the Bible makes clear something. And I think it's no wonder that the United States of America has become the number one nation affected by the coronavirus. We have surpassed any nation. We are number one <coughs> in, 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 in number of cases. And there seems not to be no hand in sight. And the reason is this. Jesus said this word in Luke chapter 12, verse 48. He who did not know, it speaks about judgment, he said, even did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For everyone to whom much, noted to, to anyone to whom much is given, from, his, from him much will be required. And to whom which much has been committed of him, they ask the more. God has giving so much to us as a nation, as a country. God has blessed us abundantly. <clears throat> and because God has blessed us, we are, God expects us to reciprocate and to respond to Him regarding and on the level of the blessing that has given unto us. When we don't do that, greater will be his punishment upon us. To whom much is given, much will be required.
I was in. I went to church last Wednesday, and as I was sitting in, in the church, praying and waiting upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit impressed in my heart and in my soul and my spirit the story of Jonah. If you're not familiar with, with the book of Jonah, Jonah was a prophet. God called him. And he said, John, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to bring a message to the city on my behalf. Jonah, I mean, Jonah, instead to go to Nineveh, he decided to go to a different city because he didn't want to obey God. He didn't want to do what God told him to do. You know the story, God then a tempest, a, a storm. While he was on the, on the ship, they're trying to run away from God's will. He was swallowed by big fish. And then while he was the fish, he came to his senses. So God commanded the fish to swallow him up. And he said that the word of the Lord came to. And in chapter 3, we'll read his word. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the thing, the method that I will tell you. Go to Nineveh. It's a great city. I'm going to give a message. And I want you to proclaim the message. Don't dilute it. Don't add it to the message. Just proclaim the method that I'm going to give to you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. A three day journey. Three day journey means there are Nineveh from one hand to the other hand, it will, it will be probably what, between 60 to 75 miles long. Big city. There's a lot of people living in Nineveh. So Jonah began to enter the city on the first day walk. And then he cried out and he said, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The method that God has given to Jonah was a simple method. You got 40 days to repent. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I don't want to be a prophet of doom. But who knows, maybe God is giving 40 days to this country to come to our senses. See, God can stop the coronavirus just in a heartbeat. He can stop it just like that. But he's looking for something. He's looking for us to do something. I want, I want you to note the response to the message. Yet 40 days. And Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people in Nineveh believe God. Note it, they believe God. There's a lot of people who don't believe God. There's a lot of people who disregard when the preacher preach and, 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 and preach and tell people it's time to repent, it's time to come back to the Lord. They disregard as not relevant. But the people of Nineveh took the message seriously. They believed God. And they proclaimed a fast and put on fat clothes Noted from the greatest to the least of them. Sackcloth was, putting on sackcloth was a symbol of humility and humbleness before God. Then war came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and lay aside his robe, covered and fell with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he closed to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the degree of the king and his noble thing, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, test anything. Don't let them eat or drink water, but let the man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. The king gave a degree. Let's cry out to God. Let's cry out mighty to God. Let's humble ourselves 
before God and they cry out to Him. Yet let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell? Who can tell if God will turn and relent? The king said, we are desperate. We have been doomed 40 days. God has given to us. Who knows? Maybe God sees a change. Maybe God sees a different attitude towards Him and towards one another. Maybe God will change His mind. And maybe God will relent and take and turn from His fierce anger so that we might not perish. What a tremendous declaration. Who can tell? Who can tell? Can we tell if we do the same thing? If God's going to stop this coronavirus and give us the victory? Look at the response. In verse 10 it says, Then God saw their works. God saw their works. That they turned from their evil ways. And God relented from the disaster that he has said he will bring upon them. And they did not perish. God is looking. Is looking for our response as a nation. He wants to see what we're going to do. He wants to see our response. Our response. Just last week, Congress and the House of Rep Representatives have a two trillion dollar stimulus package, the cor coronavirus stimulus package. package. Two trillion dollars. Let me tell you something, Mr. President. Let me tell you something, Senators. Let me tell you something, House of Representatives. Let me tell you something, Wall Street. Let me tell you something, Silicon Valley. Let me tell you something, Hollywood. Let me tell you something, Madison Avenue. Let me tell you something, religious leader. A two trillion dollars relief package is now the answer. A two trillion package will not stop the coronavirus. We need to do the same thing that the people in Nineveh did. Put on sackcloth. And cry out to God mightily, mightily, mightily. God give Nineveh 40 days. Maybe He's giving us 40 days also. How are we going to respond? What are we going to do? Let me finish with this in, in, in Jonah chapter 4. He said that it, Jonah was displeased exceedingly. He was sad. He was angry that God did not punish and destroy Nineveh. And he said this word that he prayed to the Lord and said, Our Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? That I thought I fled previously to Tarshish, but I knew. See, Jonah said, you know the reason why I ran away and I didn't come to Nineveh the first time? You know why the reason I did not obey you? Because I knew that you are the gracious and merciful and slow to anger 
and abundant in loving kindness. That's who God is. See, Jonah said, I run away from you because you are a gracious God. You are a merciful God. You are slow to anger. And you are abundant in love suffering. And that's what God is. It's not sitting up in heaven enjoying and having a good time with everything that this world is going through. No. His heart aches. His heart breaks. But he's waiting. He's waiting for our response. Forty days. Forty days. It was a warning to Nineveh. God is good. Merciful. Father, thank you. Thank you once again for reminding us who you are. How simple we are. Without holiness, a man will see God. God help us to take your word, to allow your word to grow roots in our hearts. And God help us, Lord. Help us to get along. And help us to come back to you. For unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Those who build. But I ask you that you use this word for your purpose and for your will. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you.
watching. Thank you, and we hope you enjoyed the service. Uh, I'm just going to close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for everything that you do for us, everything that you've done, everything you're doing, and everything you're about to do, Lord. Lord, I thank you for, for the message that you sent. Thank you for reminding us that we need to put you first, Lord, and we need to come together in unity, not just in our families, but in our churches, our communities, and as a nation, Lord. I ask that you help us to reflect on our own lives, Lord. I ask that you reveal to us anything that we're doing that is displeasing to you, Lord. Help us to change that. Help us to follow you, to truly put you first, and to, sh to show others the way that you want us to live, Lord. Lord, I ask that you, you help us to always put you first in our families too, Lord, so that we can be a united family. Lord, I ask that you also help us within our churches, Lord. I ask that you help us to lift each other up, Lord, to use our, our words and our actions to, to lift others up rather than put each other down. And Lord, I ask that as we come together as churches to be united together in you, Lord, that you help us to just give such a good example to those around us that they want to come and learn more about you too. And Lord, I ask that you you help all of us during this time, Lord, especially the healthcare workers who are providing care to those who are affected by the virus, Lord. I ask that you watch over them, that you you keep them protected, Lord. And I ask that you also protect all of us, Lord. Cover us with the blood of Jesus, Lord. And heal those who are affected by the virus, Lord. And I ask that we come together as a nation, Lord. Touch the hearts of our leaders and help them to put you first, Lord. Help them to seek you first above all things. And help us to just come together, Lord, and, and put you first in the place that you belong. And Lord, I thank you for everything, and I ask that you watch over all of us during this coming week, Lord. Help us to spend extra time. We we all have more time at home, Lord. I ask that you help us to use that time to grow closer to you, to spend time, quiet time with you, Lord, and, and speak to us, reveal to us anything that you want us to change about ourselves, Lord, and just draw us closer to you. And Lord, I, I thank you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.